Hi everyone. Welcome back to the Heterogeneous Parallel Programming class. Um, in the next several lectures, we're going to go over uh, several major compu parallel computation patterns. And we're going to introduce these patterns for two reasons. One is um, these patterns are very important in parallel computing in general. So these patterns are uh, important of their own. And the second one is with each pattern, we will be able to introduce some important techniques and concepts um, that uh, usually go with these patterns. And um, so uh, we're going to start with convolution. The objective of this lecture is to help you to learn convolution, which is an important parallel computation pattern, as we already mentioned. And uh, uh, this particular computation is widely used in signal processing, image processing, and video processing. And uh, more importantly, it also serves as a foundation for several other computation patterns. And uh, for example, the stencil computation that is used in many science and engineering applications. And um, uh, along with this pattern, we're going to introduce uh, important techniques for tiling data for more intricate access patterns, and also uh, how we can take advantage of some of the uh, specialized cache memories in GPUs. Let's go back to convolution a little bit. The convolution applications are usually performed as a filter that transforms signals or pixels into more desirable values. And um, this is the reason why we uh, often see convolution in the uh, sig uh, in like uh, uh, the signal processing or uh, image processing or video processing. And some of these filters are actually used to smooth out the signal values so that uh, we can see the big picture more easily. And in some other situations, um, we actually do the opposite. We, uh, we use something like uh, Gaussian filters as a convolution computation to sharpen the, bound, uh, the boundaries and edges of objects in images. So um, what is com uh, convolution computation? Um, concretely, a convolution computation is an array operation where each output data element is a weighted sum of a collection of neighboring input elements. In general, when we perform convolution, we will transform a input array into an output array of the same size. And the, uh, there will, there is usually a one-to-one -one correspondence between the input array element and output array element. To compute each output array element, we will take the input element in uh, corresponding input element in the input array and some of the neighboring elements in that, uh, in that input array to perform a weighted sum calculation. And the weights used in this calculation are defined as an input mask array. And um, this is commonly referred to as convolution kernel. But unfortunately, in CUDA, kernel also uh, has the meaning of kernel functions. So in order to avoid uh, confusion, we're not going to call, um, call these uh, masks convolution kernels, but we are going to call them convolution masks. And um, uh, the same convolution mask is usually used in calculating all the output elements in a particular convolution um, computation. So here is a very simple example of one dimensional convolution. And here we show a mask of five elements. And um, uh, in order to calculate one output element, we're going to take its corresponding input element, and we're going to take the mask and align that mask the middle, the center of the mask to the uh, corresponding input element. So in this case, we have a, uh, we're going to calculate P2 in the output, and the corresponding input is N2. And then uh, we're going to take the center of the mask, which is M2, and we're going to align M2 with N2 so that M0 will be aligned to M, uh, N0, M1 is going to align to N1, and so on. And this after this alignment, we're going to do a pairwise multiplication. That's how we do the weighted uh, part. And um, uh, the pairwise uh, multiplication is going to give us uh, 1 times 3, which is 3, and then uh, 2 times 4, which is 8 here, and then 3 times 5, which is 15, and then 4 times 4, 16, and so on. And then uh, 
once we have all these uh, uh, products, we're going to add them together. So that's why it's a weighted sum calculation. And once we added up all these five values, it, they become the uh, output value 57 in P2. So um, uh, in general, uh, we, would, we often use fractions for the mask values so that we don't just produce bigger and bigger values as we calculate the weighted sum. However, for this particular example, for simplicity, we use integer values just so that uh, it's easy for you to see the, um, the computation pattern. And um, uh, when we calculate the next element, P3, um, we again use the same mask. However, now the center of the mask is now aligned to um, the corresponding input element N3. So uh, now we are aligning uh, N1 with M0, N2 with M1, and so on. And we're still going to be calculate, uh, doing the same weighted sum calculation. So uh, we have 2 times 3, which is 6 here, and then 3 times 4, which is 12 here. And then um, uh, we finish all the calculation, and we, uh, we sum up all the products into the uh, answer for P3. So now, as you can see, by taking the same mask and shifting the mask through each input element, we will be able to produce each output element um, as we uh, continue this computation. And you can also see that uh, because the calculation of P2, P3, and so on are independent of each other, so uh, this is intrinsically a very parallel computation. Convolution also has boundary conditions. When we calculate an output uh, element that is close to the beginning or end of the uh, output array, we're going to uh, face some uh, boundary conditions. So for example, when we calculate P1, uh, we need to uh, have two input elements to the left. Unfortunately, we only have one input element in the violet range. So we will have, we will essentially have or one of the mask elements to pair up with a non-existing element. So this is uh, what we call the ghost uh, element. And um, uh, this element does not exist in the input. However, when we calculate a, uh, one of the outputs that are close to the boundary, we're going to need to uh, have some kind of policy to determine the value of these non-existing elements. And uh, there are various policies um, that we can use. For example, we can just say, oh, all the non-existing elements will have zero value, which is what we're going to use in the lab assignments. But in some of the applications, um, they also uh, they, uh, they could have a policy where uh, we'll say, okay, all the non-existing elements will assume exactly the same value as the, uh, the, va the uh, P0. So uh, that's also a valid uh, uh, policy. And depending on the application, we can have different policies for determining uh, these ghost elements. And so uh, in, as I mentioned, in our labs, we're going to just assume that all the non-existing elements will assume a value zero uh, in our calculations. So here is a simple kernel that does 1D convolution in CUDA. And um, uh, we're going to, you know, to, to uh, take several inputs, uh, the input array, uh, N, and then uh, the uh, mask array, M. And um, uh, we're going to have a, uh, a, a mask width, and the, uh, the, which is the number of elements in the mask, and then the uh, width, which is the, element, uh, the number of elements in the input array. Of course, we will need to have the output, a pointer to the output array, P. So uh, well, this is a very familiar uh, expression for you, which uh, assigns one thread to each of the output elements. So this, this is a very familiar expression. And then uh, for the particular output element, we're going to initialize that value to zero. And um, uh, remember that the, in the input array, well, we need to have several neighbor elements. So the, uh, the beginning of the input neighborhood that we'll be using for calculating a particular element is half of the mask uh, to the left for a 1D uh, calculation. So in our previous slide, uh, we see that uh, when we calculate P3, 
we need to have N1 as the beginning of that neighborhood. So we're, uh, we're taking the mask that, uh, width, which is 5, divided by 2, that gives us half the width. Because it's an odd number and the C integer uh, division is, uh, is, it will trunc truncate the output value. So uh, we will get a value 2. So this gives us a, uh, the element that is 2 uh, before the corresponding input element. So this is how we calculate that input starting point. The starting point is the beginning of the neighborhood that we're using for the weighted sum calculation. So um, once you understand the input uh, point variable, we can go into this, uh, this neighborhood pro, uh, uh, sum of weighted sum calculation by looping through all the, um, the, the mask elements and their corresponding input elements. So we will start with the n starting point, and m will start with element 0. We'll be doing a pairwise product. So that's the j component. And we, once we do the pairwise uh, mul uh, multiplication, we accumulate the product into the p value. Once we have gone through the entire mask uh, width, then we have calculated the weighted sum of that neighborhood. Um, during the calculation, we also need to, uh, to be careful that um, the starting point that we use is actually, uh, you know, well, within the valid range. So we, we're taking a uh, starting point plus j and c if it's greater than or equal to zero. And um, if it is not greater than or equal to zero, we're not going to do the calculation, which means that we assume that the ghost element is zero. When we have a zero, that ghost element is not going to affect the weighted sum, so we don't need to do this accumulation. The same uh, test is also done on the right-hand side. That is, the, when the end start point plus j, the input element that we're using for this weighted sum is uh, greater than or equal to the width, then we, uh, we also assume that uh, they are, these ghost elements are of zero value. So we're going to skip this uh, accumulation step by assuming that those values are zero. So this particular for loop with the, co uh, the conditional uh, if test essentially implements a policy that all the ghost elements outside the value range are of zero value. Once we finish the entire weighted sum calculation, we have the answer for the output element in p-value. So now we can write p-value into the corresponding position in the output array. Now that you understand the 1D uh, convolution, 2D convolution is a very straightforward uh, generalization of 1D convolution. So we have an, uh, uh, a output in uh, a 2D uh, array, and um, uh, it's calculated based on the corresponding element in a two-dimensional input array. And whenever we calculate an output, we take the corresponding input element, and we have a two-dimensional neighborhood that we're going to, uh, we're going to use. To, uh, and the mask is now also going to be a two-dimensional array that defines that neighborhood. And we will be, uh, again, using pairwise uh, multiplication. So 1 times 1 is 1 here. And then 2 times 2 is 4. So we see the element 4 in the product. So this is a pairwise output uh, of all the elements involved. And then we do a sum. We simply do a, a, a sum of this, uh, of this product array into the final answer. So again, we see that uh, this, the output element is simply a weighted sum of all the elements in the defined neighborhood of this corresponding input element. Just as in the 1D convolution, a 2D convolution can also um, have boundary conditions. When we calculate a uh, output element that is close to the uh, edges of the uh, array, we can, we can have a situation where the neighborhood will extend beyond the in, uh, valid input. So in this case, we also assume that um, all the ghost elements are of value zero. So uh, when you see the, um, when you write a 2D convolution kernel, you should have a similar condition test uh, 
in that for loop is just that the for loop is, should be now a two-dimensional for loop that goes through both the x and y dimension to, uh, to uh, calculate a weighted sum of a two-dimensional area rather than uh, just a one-dimensional area. So this concludes the introduction to convolution computation. And um, um, with this, you know, uh, if you are interested in uh, learning more about the convolution uh, computation, I'd like to encourage you to read the textbook sections 8.1 and 8.2. Thank you.